Uh, I want to thank the Mitocon and the scientific faculty for the invitation, which has now become, uh, to my great pleasure, a welcome annual appointment. Um, the title of my speech is Epigenetic of Pregnancy uh, When Coding DNA is Not the Boss, <laughs> and um, comes from the many conversations with uh, couples that I follow during uh, my medical activity who are approaching heterologous assisted reproduction with egg uh, donation. Egg donation, the main indication are uh, several. First of all, the advanced maternal age, in fact, while we women are always young, of course, unfortunately, our oocytes do not. And they age by reducing their number and worsening uh, their quality or by accumulating errors, especially in the number of chromosomes. This physiological process means that for uh, 40 years, years old um, oh. woman, the changes of getting naturally pregnant uh, are reduced to less than 5%. And uh, uh, after 43, the chance uh, to, um, of a full-term physiologically uh, pregnancy is about 1 in 3,000. Um, another uh, important uh, implication and indication for egg donation is the poor ovarian reserve or the premature ovarian failure. The um, women at birth uh, have about 1 million eggs available. By the time they reach puberty, the number has already greatly reduced to around 400,000 eggs. Of these, each woman will have an average um, only between 300 and 400 ovulation to be fertilized during uh, the reproductive life. However, it may happen that the ovarian reserve uh, ends earlier than expected or the woman uh, enter early menopause. It's important in these cases to look for the cause, which in 10% of the time is of genetic origin, such as X chromosome abnormalities or a pre-mutation of the Fraxe gene. The latter cause of poor POF is important to identify because it also put a woman at the risk of having a child with mental retardation. The last frequent indication for egg donation are chromosomal or genetic abnormalities that cannot be solved with the pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or prenatal diagnosis, such as couples with mitochondrial diseases who in 90, 95% of cases choose egg donation rather than IVF with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, given that the latter does not um, guarantee 100% the not transmission of the mitochondrial mutation to their child. Um, um, when I discuss with my couple um, the possibility of an egg donation, I always underline an important concept, uh, namely importance of the box and not just the content. What do I mean by this? Content is the DNA, our magnificent book of life. DNA is made up of about three gigabytes of nucleotides or about 25,000 genes that encode at least four times the number, about 100,000 proteins, thanks to the mechanism of alternative splicing. That is, the same gene can give rise to different proteins based on the pieces of the gene we use to build it. But it needs to be emphasized that only 3% of our DNA is coding, meaning it contains instruction for making proteins. But then, what is the rest of DNA for? 70% of the rest of the DNA is composed of regulatory sequences, which turn off and turn on the expression of specific genes in specific tissues or moments or life. Still, about 10% of our DNA is composed by sequences of microRNA, the MIRNA, 
of nucleic acids that are not translated. MIRNA have a regulatory function in a wide variety of cellular processes, including metabolism, proliferation, apoptosis, vasculogenesis, and activation of the immune system. The MIRNA have also uh, proved very important at the endometrial level, and we will see very well this particular case. And here we are in the box. So we are not still uh, talking about the content, but the box, the place where the miracle of life takes place. As we know, an embryo cannot survive more than a week, 10 days in vitro. And after this period, it needs to be transferred and nested in the mother uterus. The birth of life is not possible without the uterus. And at this level, incredible transformation take place that allow first implantation, then nesting, and finally, decidualization. The tissue mainly involved in this process is the endometrium, perhaps the least known tissue in medicine after the brain, because it's difficult, very difficult to study in vivo. From the latest uh, scientific evidence, it's clear that uh, there is an intensive endometrium embryo crosstalk uh, right from the fertilization to the oocyte. The, this crosstalk results in an intense interchange of more than 250 factors, including cytokine, grow and angiogenesis factors, and MIRNA, of course, again, MIRNA. Indeed, a large number of MIRNA in a wide range of regulatory function have been discovered in the endometrial fluid. Several animal studies have been carried out, in particular on ruminants, horses, pig, rodents, and some in primates. And we are starting now to have confirmation also in human. For those wishing to learn more about, I suggest the, the beautiful special issue of the International Journal of Molecular Sciences dedicated to embryo maternal interaction, from which I took the images of my talk. So if you are interested, please uh, read this uh, very interesting special issue. Uh, for example, the mechanism of biogenesis secretion and cargo of uterine exosome and extracellular microvesicles during the pre-implantation period has been well studied, for example, in ruminants. Exosomes are small membrane-bound vesicles with a diameter of 50, uh, 150 nanometers, which are derived from endosomal multivesicular bodies. Microvesicles are instead released directly from the plasma membrane with a diameter of 100, 1000 nanometers into the extracellular space by budding and fission. Exosome and microvesicles contain a variety of bioactive molecules, including soluble and membrane-bound proteins, lipids, metabolites, DNA and RNA, including messenger RNA, microRNA and other small regulatory RNA, which regulate cellular activity of the recipient cell. During uh, the stage of implantation, the extracellular vesicles are secreted by the embryo and or endometrium into the uterine microenvironment, and it has been established that they have autocrine and or paracrine biological effect on appropriate communication between the embryo and the uterine endometrium. Extracellular vesicles are also interactive and coordinate with the ovarian progesterone, embryo-derived interferon tau, prostaglandins for successful embryo implantation and subsequent pregnancy uh, establishment. The same is true. The same is true for exosomes that are released from both endometrium and the embryo and are internalized through specific receptors. The content of exosomes, including various uh, nucleic acids, does exert its biological activity of gene regulation. So, exosomal MIRNA in the endometrial fluid is the way in which the MAM DNA influences the expression of the fetus gene. 
But is this mechanism important or marginal? How many Myrna are secreted from the maternal endometrium? Thousands, really thousands. You can see on this picture. And the difference between cyclic endometrium and activated endometrium is impressive, especially for the switch, not only quantitative, but qualitative. That is the number, the type of Myrna secreted change, as you can see from this very huge number, very huge difference. All cells that are part of the endometrial tissue participate in this secretion of embryonic regulatory factor, including vascular cells and cells of the immune system. This fine regulation allows proper development of the placental vascular network and the establishment of maternal fetal immunological tolerance. So, are the Myrna the secret messenger of pregnancy? Probably yes, probably this is the answer. Data from bovine show which are the target embryonic cellular regulatory pathway of the endometrial secreted Myrna. If we examine mine in detail, we find generic cellular approaches such as the regulation of apoptosis, mitochondrial organization, cellular response to external stimuli such as infection, but also the regulation of very specific higher functions such as neuronal organization, in this animal, we have seen how an alteration of endometrial fluids enter the pathogenesis of neurological disease in adults, such as Alzheimer's disease and adult onset mental disorder. This is something revolutionary. We are now starting to understand what we had always suspected, that is a disturbance of the physiological condition of pregnancy can affect the development of both the fetus, the child, and the adult. And this happens due, due to dysregulation of the function of the endometrium and then the placenta. During development, the placenta can be said to be the most important organ, however, the most poorly researched. There is currently a broader understanding of how specific insults during development affect the fetal brain and also the importance of placental signaling in neurodevelopmental programming. The placenta is a potent microenvironmental player in neurodevelopment as it orchestrates a series of complex maternal fetal interactions. Uh, maternal insult of this uh, microenvironment will impair this process and disrupt the fetal brain development, resulting in uh, prenatal programming of neurodevelopmental disorder. We now begin to apprise gene environment impact during pregnancy that can cause the development of adult onset mental disorder. In practice, we are talking about epigenetic responses to maternal and fetal signal that transform early life inputs into long-term programming outcome. As a mediator of maternal and environmental signal to the developing fetus, epigenetic processes within the placenta are particularly powerful, such that alteration of placenta gene expression, downstream function and signaling during fetal development have the potential to dramatic changes in development programming. There are hundreds of articles published on how epigenetic changes in terms of prenatal experiences and maternal prenatal psychosocial stress are associated with change in infant mental health and adult brain. Maternal hormonal and nutrient environment can be systematically implicated in effects of developing fetus, so ultimately influences susceptibility to a wide range of metabolic, neurodevelopmental and psychiatric disease in adulthood. There is a growing appreci appreciation that perturbation in the maternal environment are conveyed uh, to the fetus by changes in placental function. Together, this study suggests that the traditional view of the placenta as a passive site of transport of maternal nutrients, growth factor, and hormone needs to be expanded 
to include a role in supporting central nervous system development through adaptive response to the maternal environment. In addition to affecting fetal growth, maternal nutrient status has also been reported to directly influence neuronal development during gestation. Ultimately, it's seen that the placenta is a window to the brain through the epigenetic mechanism. But what is epigenetics at this point? <laughs> epigenetics is the study of irritable changes in gene expression, expression, active versus inactive genes that do not involve changes to the underlying DNA sequencing. Is a change in phenotype without a change in genotype? In, in simple term, epigenetics is the study of mechanisms that switch genes on or off. It is involving every aspect of life is such a reversible, potentially heritable change affect the way we live as well as our future generation. Um, epigenetics, therefore, is not only the effect of cellular regulatory factor external to DNA, but also the action of environmental factors that can modify the way in which DNA is expressed. For example, we know that the mother, what the mother eats during pregnancy can increase the risk of the baby becoming obese as an adult, among other several health disorders. However, the link between these two is much more complex than we thought, as epidemiological and animal study have revealed uh, strong relationship between uh, early life nutrition or hormonal environment and the consequent malprogramming of a narrow endocrine, uh, endocrine system which regulate body weight, food intake and metabolism. Research suggests that a series, a series of epigenetic mechanisms might regulate the appetite and reward signal to guarantee to warrant an adequate and continuous calorie intake during the early postnatal life, regulating the eating behavior. This article, uh, which is very in my life, this article published uh, almost 15 years ago, already clarified very well what it means um, to influence environmental factors such as diet during pregnancy. I, um, I sometimes show this picture to uh, my, um, my couples. Uh, these two mice are genetically identical, but uh, the one on the right grew in an uterus of normal fed mother, while the one on the left grew in the uterus in a overfed and nutritionally deficient mother. Um, I would say that the phenotypic difference is very evident. Certainly, the influence of environmental and uterine factor in fetal development are um, topics that couples who choose egg donation are very sensitive to. Also, because they are easy to understand. But, as always, I remind them, to my couples, there is some, uh, something else that, that we must not forget and which always falls uh, within the incredible world of alternative genetics that is uh, epigenetics. Um, uh, there is a problem with that. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, we don't have to forget uh, the breastfeeding and the uh, gut uh, microbiome. Many people believe that breastfeeding is the best gift a mother can offer to her child. Um, it has uh, lots of benefits, not only because breast milk contains the right amounts of nutrients, of course, but also because uh, it, uh, uh, it's packed with lots of antibody and biologically, biological active compounds then play a key role in boosting a baby's immune system. Breast milk has been shown to protect newborns against many diseases commonly experienced during the first year of life, and research has begun to make connection between the benefits of breastfeeding and epigenetics. Early nutrition can influence DNA 
same methylation because one carbon metabolism is dependent on dietary methyl donors and cofactors, including methionine, choline, folic acid, and vitamin B12. For example, three main diseases and disorders that breast milk may epigenetically protect against uh, our disorder of uh, immune system, obesity and related disorder, inflammatory bowel diseases. In the onset of these last disorders, the importance of the good microbiome has uh, recently come to the fore, which is uh, precisely transmitted from mother to baby during breastfeeding. The gut is considered our second brain, and there is still many things to discover in this area. And I'm sure that this research will reserve us some surprise in, in the process in the next future. Finally, we must not forget the parental care and the imitative behavior. In fact, the young child's ability to imitate the action of other is an important mechanism for social learning, that is, for acquiring new knowledge. Many women tell me that friends say that the baby obtained from egg donation looks like them. <laughs> because he laughs like the mother, he squints like his mother. How is possible? This is the imitative behavior. That is, the child learns the facial expression of those who take care of him 24 hours per day. That is mom and dad. And here the donor has nothing to do with it. So, in conclusion... The box is uh, as important as the content, and the coding DNA is no longer the boss. Epigenetics uh, is the new boss. 